he didn't have a title per se as you know minister or pastor or uh, uh, evangelist or you know whatever some of the spiritual titles we throw around. Um, he was a he was a, as we know he was the king's cupbearer, but he was just a, just an ordinary guy. But he was placed in position of leadership. He was a, a, a governmental leader, but praise God, he was also a spiritual man. He was a praying man, okay, because we see a number of prayers that he offered in, in this book, uh, some quick prayers, some longer prayers, but, but a praying man nonetheless. And, and oh, how this nation would be so much further off if our government leaders were, were men of prayer. Men and well, women too. Women <laughs> were men and women of prayer. Now, I mean, they say they are, <laughs> okay, but people can say anything. People get in there and they s- they they take their positions and they raise their right hand and swear on the Bible that they're gonna do thus and so, and they have no problem coming to the churches and to campaign and to get the word out and then and then I guess asked about their religious religious philosophy. Oh yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, and you know they tell you all this, but then their actions you know, and their policy, some of the policies that they, they, they endorse are, are contrary, you know, to the word of God. And so, um, you know, our nation and, and, and most nations around the world would be uh, a lot further off if they were not just uh, 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 political leaders and not just governmental leaders, but also spiritual leaders, okay? But we see in this case, Nehemiah, uh, again, not having the title of priest or, or Levite or anything like that, but, but we see that he was a praying man, okay? And again, it speaks to us today that anyone in God's house, anyone that is a Christian or is a follower of God doesn't have to have the title to do a work for God. And, and, and uh, I shared on the call last night that as when I, when I first got into the, I guess the deaconship, <laughs> I guess is what it's called, uh, at my former church, that I always thought that some of the things that that we would do, that these were things that only ministers could do, that be it baptizing, be it uh, serving communion, be it, uh, what else, anointing somebody's head with oil, that, that that is laity. We can all do that, that we don't have to say, well, that's the pastor's job, that's, so, that's so-and-so's job. And I know Brother Derek shared with us that, that his father, Brother Ellis, actually baptized him in their bathtub. And, I mean, Ellis doesn't have that title of pastor or minister or, or anything, even though he is a minister, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't, he's not officially quote unquote, you know, the ministers, but just as a lay person and a, and a follower of Christ, a believer in Christ and a follower of God, that, that he can do these things, okay, and, and, and we can all do these things, and so, uh, again, that we don't have to have the official title of something to do something, you can still be effective in God's house without the so-called title, okay, so that's, I guess what I want to leave you with. And so we see, again, so you have one government leader, there, one Tershatha, that being Nehemiah. Then it goes on to list 22 priests, okay, and then 17 Levites, okay, and then we see 44, I guess they, they label them as chief or heads of household, basically heads of households. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the exact term there that they have for that. If I'll be on the right page. The chief of the people. 40 f- so they list, they're going to list 44 of these people. And these, were again, were basically heads of household. These were leaders in the community. And so you have your government leaders, you ha- or your government leader, it's just one. Then you have your spiritual leaders, okay, followed by your civic leaders, okay. And so uh, in total, 84 names, 84 names in this list. And, and, and like I said, I'm big on numbers in, in scripture. And so when I looked at that, I saw that, that 84 is a product of 7 and 12. And 7 and 12 are, are two very important numbers throughout scripture. Okay, as we all know, the number 7 in scripture typically represents completeness. Typically, it's, it's spiritual completeness, uh, spiritual perfection. Um, 7, again, being a very important number or very prominent, I won't say important, but prominent number throughout scripture. And the same with the number 12. In fact, these are probably the two most prominent numbers in scripture, probably other than three, but seven and 12, because 12, again, you know, got 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel, you know, 12 months in the year, 12, you know, 12 typically in scripture represents or is symbolic of spiritual authority. 
or government. Okay, and so in with with both of these numbers, mul you know, multiply both these numbers together, you get 84, which is the number of names on this list. And so it really speaks to that that this represents really a a, a, a complete sp uh, and spirit a spiritual complete authority. Okay, and I know that some people say, well, that's kind of you know far off, whatever. But like I said, numbers it's too coincidental. You know what I mean? That these numbers, when they pop up and you kind of point to what these numbers represent, and it's like, and, and, and I mean, I believe like scripture, nothing is really coincidental uh, in scripture that there's really a divine order to things. And, and God, again, with this number being what it is, and we see again the numbers 7 and 12 uh, uh, representing the 84. And again, just I think God in his order has the way he has his hands on things. He just, again, it's just perfect. <laughs> you know, how he puts things together. And so, uh, not to dwell too long on that, but then we see in this list, again, it goes on to list the rest of the people uh, after, because I think these first 84 names were actually the ones that sealed the document. And then the rest of the people were uh, in agreement with, you know, what the 84 were doing, because, like, you know, you probably had thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people, and obviously all of them can't sign this document. <laughs> you know, it'd be like a phone book <laughs> then, or, or uh, you know, you can't have all, everyone seal it, but I mean, I think 84 names is enough, <laughs> you know, to seal any, to seal any document, but we know the people all fell in line with that, that we don't read of any objections uh, to this, uh, 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 this covenant agreement, this written document, and again, the importance of it being written out, um, because again, it takes your level of accountability to another level because, again, we can read the word of God and we can promise anything out our mouths. You know, we can verbally say, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to read the word hour a day, I'm going to, you know, pray three times a day, I'm going to do this, that, all of, you know, we talk about all the things we're going to do, but then when it's written on paper and you put your name to it, then it's, again, it, it takes it, again, to another level. And so, again, speaking of that, again, I want to, I'll probably put my, br my, my brethren on blast here for a, s for a minute, um, that at one of our men's meetings, we, uh, it was about maybe 12 to maybe 15 of us at our meeting uh, one Saturday. Uh, this was back in, I think, 2015. And we came together and we, were, we came to why we were watching a movie. And the movie was, uh, I believe it was Courageous, uh, I forget, but it was the one where you know, you had these four do four guys. I think one was a fireman and policeman and um, whatever. You know, just four guys. And by the end of the movie, they wanted to turn their lives around and 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 commit to God. And it wasn't enough for them just to uh, uh, just profess, you know, their faith and their belief and whatnot. They wanted uh, really to take it to another level. And so they made what. This this resolution here is is really from the movie, and we had we watched this movie, and so by the end of the movie, I uh, I had a stack of these documents, and I wanted to I wanted the brethren to kind of uh, again take their faith and their belief to the uh, not their belief but take their their um, their commitment thank you to the next level, and sign this document. And to then not just then sign it and not just to put it in your sock drawer and put it away, but then to display it in your home, mm -hmm. to hang it, find a place in your house and hang it up. And, 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 and what that does then is make yourself accountable to what you're saying on this document. Okay. I thought he posted up. But, and then, uh, and so what we did, so by the end of the movie, we were there, it was like maybe a two, two and a half hour movie or whatnot. And you know how brothers get, we get impatient. And you know, it's a Saturday and we're trying to get out and we want to go and enjoy our weekend and whatnot. And so by the end of the movie, I would say over half the brethren just, okay, see you, God bless you, I'm out, boom. <laughs> and so we never really got to the document, but it was just interesting that, that when, okay, I, we we're asking them to, okay, put their name on something, sign it, hold, make yourself be held accountable for that. I think there were maybe only myself and a couple others that actually signed the document and did this and it just goes to show that that when you know that okay we we can read this now and says okay yeah no big deal you know just sign the document just just but it is a big deal because if, if, if you're presented with a document if i go up to you uh brother sister battle rather and i give you this document and i say okay i need you to sign this document this contract okay this covenant 
this resolution. I need you to sign this and then and then do your best to live by it. Then I mean, she may be oh, <laughs> you know, you know, she may be kind of hesitant to do that, as as most of us would be probably. I mean, some of us will probably sign it anyway. I mean, we'd look it over very carefully and says, okay, what exactly am I getting myself into here? Or what is this document actually saying? Because, I mean, you want to read the fine print and everything. <laughs> and so, because, you know, no telling what this, because once you put your name on it and you've signed it, now you're accountable yeah. to what it says. <laughs> and there's, and, and I think when we talk about, well, which we'll get into later, but when we talk about covenants, that, again, covenants speak to a number of things. But one of the things, especially written covenant, written contract, uh, 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 really provides a level of clarity. And what I mean by that is that when, uh, uh, Christ, or not Christ, but when um, God, the Creator, you know, was creating everything, made the earth, He made mankind, and He told Adam that, okay, of all the trees you can freely eat, but don't mess with this one. Okay, then He passed that on, that message on to Eve, allegedly, and and then, and so from that, now there was some confusion because now when Satan comes on the scene, he says, now did God really say, <laughs> you know? Did he really say that you should? And because we're in the condition we're, at, you know, we're in now, because there was no clarity. Now, now maybe if they had a written document <laughs> at the time, and then so, okay, Adam could say to Eve, okay, Eve, this is exactly what God says. He says, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. All right, okay, this is what you can do, this is what you can do. It's black and white and on, on paper, you know, it's right here. And so now when Satan comes up to Eve to try to beguile her, she can whip out the paper and says, hey, say, no, God said thus and so. But because, you know, at that moment there was, it wasn't written down that th there was room for some ambiguity. That now Satan can come in and say, okay, well, did he really say that? And, did and now she's going off of me. Well, well, well wait a minute. What did he <laughs> and, and, and so now the door is open and Satan can come on in. And so all I'm saying with that is that now, you know, again, next level accountability is when something is written down on paper. Now it's in black and white. And there can be, it, it kind of closes that door. Not saying that people are always going to follow it. I mean, they can still break covenants. They do all the time. People break contracts. People break covenants all the time, whether they're on paper or not. And so, but again, it's the next, it's, it's next level accountability is, is, I guess, all we're getting at here. And so the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanim, uh, all that separated, that, that separated themselves uh, from the folks of the land. And we see and their wives and their sons and their daughters and everyone with knowledge and understanding, meaning that all of all the people that that were there and that understood, that that knew and understood, uh, were part of this. That 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 means even your young people. Okay, so the young people, if they're old enough to to know what you're talking about, and they're old enough to understand what you're talking about, then they are old enough to enter into this covenant. Okay, because a lot of times we we kind of you know just give our young people the the excuse or the uh, 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 the avenue out to okay. Well, they're too young. They don't. They don't know. And and I, I would contest that because I know you know you'd be surprised what some of these young folks know <laughs> that that you know young folks know way more than we give them credit for. And, if, and that if they can open the Word of God and have a level of understanding, and that's where again teaching is important. That if the parent is able to answer the questions of what you know a particular scripture is saying and what it means this that and the other if they can relay that over and so that they can provide a level of understanding that young person then can enter into the covenant uh, with God and so that's even true to this day that 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 if they can understand for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten then they can they can profess Christ and be saved okay and so again so you have you know the obviously the older folks that 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 understood and but also again the young people so all that uh were able to understand able to nod if they were able to read it and understand it then they were able to take part uh in this covenant okay and so now we get to uh verse 29 which is so that's your first 28 verses here is just again your list and again the structure just noting again how your leader was first as he should be uh, not leading from the back but leading out front but followed by your other uh, spiritual and civic leaders. 
Okay, then 29, then we get into the actual covenant, and this verse 29 verse kind of speaks in generality. Okay, it's a broad brush that they use as that they entered into a curse and an oath. Uh, it actually reads, uh, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, or excuse me, of the Lord our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. Okay, and so we see that they entered, and hopefully there's, there's I don't know if anyone is, has, is, is ambiguous on w- when it says that they entered into a curse. Are we, do we all understand that? Or? No. Okay, good. And so, <laughs> and so really it's kind of, uh, it's kind of two-sided, that statement. And, and so when we say w- they entered into a curse, it's kind of like when we say that when we swear, when you swear an oath, like say, oh, I swear to God that this, that, and the other, because when you swear, that, that's cursing. <laughs> okay, and so, and so it's, it's that, but also that they accept the responsibility of, of, of breaking this covenant, that they get this oath that they get into, that if they break this oath, they understand that there will be curses uh, uh, that occur if they break oath. Okay, and so, so it's kind of twofold in that way. So when we say that, you know, I swear on my mother's, you know, apron <laughs> or whatever that, you know, that what I'm telling you is true, or I swear to this, or I swear to that, and 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 so that's a form of the curse. They're basically saying that they swore an oath. Okay, and then again, the flip side of that is that they understand that if they break covenant that they are they understand that there will be curses that occur for breaking this oath okay and so they swore an oath to do three things one to walk you see that and then to observe and then to do okay so they're walking in the law they're observing and doing the commandments judgments and statutes and those all those words law commandments judgments and statutes are all synonyms for his word Okay, because there is a, 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 I don't know the exact chapter, but in Psalms, there is a, I believe 139, uh, I think the longest chapter in scripture, and the whole chapter, if I'm I'm not mistaken, the whole chapter is really an ode to the word of God, and every verse, but maybe out of 139 chapters, uh, or verses rather, not chapters, verses, it's, it's 22 chapters, because the way that this, this if, I'm, if it's the right psalm, but the way this chapter breaks down is that you have 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, okay, and so there are 22 chapters, and each chapter, sh- each, each verse is eight verses, okay, eight times 22 is where we get the number of verses in totality, but each chapter is like, okay, the first chapter, so I'm kind of, I need to kind of relay it to our alphabet so you understand it, even though we got 26 letters. But the first chapter would be eight verses, and they all start with A. Then the next chapter, two, then, would be eight verses, and they all start with B. Then they all start with C, then D, then E. And so that's the way it is in this Hebrew, in this chapter, in the Hebrew alphabet. So the first letter is Alpha, uh, or Aleph, rather, and so they all start will start with that letter, then the B w- would be the bet, and, they s- and then that's your next letter, I'll bet. bet. 119, is it? Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's why I like you there. <laughs> and good stuff. And so, uh, but, but this chapter, again, each, each verse except, like all the verses in that chapter except maybe three or four, three or four, it's a handful, but they all have the word law, statutes, commandments, judgments, and they're all synonymous with the word of God. Because that's what this, this whole in chapter is talking about, the word of God. And so when we see law, commandments, judgments, statutes, precepts, um, what are some other words? Um, I think that's it. Law, commandments, judgments, statutes, precepts. Um, but every every verse in there has one of those words in there, and it's all synonymous with the word of God. And so that's what we're talking about here. And so in general, this is a general commitment that it, this kind of a broad brush commitment that is say we're going to f- we're going to live we're going to follow God's law, uh, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, 
and then to observe and do all of his commandments. And so that this is one of the, the promises that they agreed uh, to do. Okay, and so that's kind of your general thing. And so when we speak of covenant, um, again, the covenant, and before we move on to the other verses here, when we're talking about covenants, we understand that there is an old covenant, I'm talking today now, that there's an old covenant and a new covenant. Okay, and covenants, well, let me talk about the concept of covenant first, that, that, that we don't, and they didn't, they, don't, they didn't make a covenant, they, did a, they cut a covenant. Cut, C-U-T, that they cut a covenant, that they didn't make a covenant, they cut a covenant, and that it was because that how covenants were done then is that they would take an animal, probably a bull or goat or something, and you remember they would cut this animal in half, and then they would uh, uh, agree to whatever they're agreeing to. I guess they would walk through, you know, the blood of this animal. And basically the covenant, the, the wording of this covenant says, okay, let happen to me what happened to this animal if I don't obey this covenant. <laughs> okay. And so that's, that's why they cut a covenant. And so the context of cutting a covenant implies a number of things. One, it, uh, it implies sacrifice. Okay. Then it implies cost, costs, plural, because to cut a covenant costs something. It costs somebody something or something something. That, and, and what I mean by that is that if you're cutting a covenant in the way they did it then, it costs that animal his life. <laughs> you know, or even it costs the owner of that animal you know, to lose that animal. <laughs> okay? In, in Christ's uh, sense, it cost Christ his life that, that he... he he was the, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so he was the sacrificial lamb that went to the cross on our behalf. And so uh, in that covenant, he, he, it cost him his life. Okay. It caught, and, and, and it implies, impl impl uh, get it out, implies bloodshed. That when we talk about cutting a covenant, that there is a, a bloodshed that occurs. Okay. And so. So we see here that in the old covenant was based on what people did, what the people did, that, that it was a, a, a kind of a thing that, okay, you need to follow, just as it says here, I guess I'm going to use my pointer, that just what it says here, that they entered into a curse to do these things, that they, that they, wanted, they were going to walk in God's law, they were going to observe and then do what his word says, that, in, that unlike now, we... It's not based on what, what we do. It's based on what Jesus did. Amen. That's the new covenant. So we're under a better covenant today than the old covenant because, again, it's not based on works. It's based on what Christ has already done. Amen. Okay. And then so we see in the old covenant there was ongoing sacrifices that they had to repeatedly sacrifice animals. Uh, th that blood had to continuously be shed to wash away the sins of the land and of, of the people, but we see in the new covenant it's a one-time sacrifice, that what Christ did was sufficient for sins, past, present, and future, yeah. okay, that, that his blood, uh, when, when God looks at us and looks at our sinful nature, he doesn't see us, he sees because we're covered by the blood of Christ, and that's what, that's what God sees when he looks at us, he's not looking at our, 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 our uh, at the, bad the bad shape that we are in, he just sees the blood of Christ, and because of that we are uh, we are that blood then atones for whatever we've done, and we can we're in, we're still in right fellowship with God the Father. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was an earn and deserve in the under the old covenant, kind of an earn and deserve type of uh, relationship deal here. That that if you do these things, you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you um, follow the law of Moses, if you follow the Ten Commandments, but the thing about it that no one could completely follow. <laughs> okay. And so under the new covenant, uh, it is kind of a believe and receive uh, type of relationship. And when I say that, it's not receive that, you know, we're not saying that, you know, it's not those name it and claim it type things. I'm not, I'm not speaking about that, but I'm saying that, that our, our, our blessings, our relationship with Christ starts with faith, that it starts with the fact that we, that we believe, okay, and and so that, again, gets into our, our covenants. And then we see a number of Old Testament covenants uh, listed here. And so uh, I asked DeYoung to have a video queued up that, that I thought really kind of got into covenants really well before we get on to the rest of 
of, of this chapter. So you can uh, cue that up, Brother Dion, and then we will keep it moving. Do you know what a covenant is? A covenant is a contract or an agreement. In the Bible, covenants are made between God and His people. There are eight covenants in the Bible. Understanding these covenants is the key to understanding the entire meta-narrative of God's purposes and ultimate will for His people. Let's take a look. The Edenic Covenant. The key word here is the word rule. In Genesis 2.15, right after God had created man, He put him in the garden and told him to care for it. From the very beginning, God's eternal purpose for man was to rule and enjoy him forever. Psalm 8 says, You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. David was saying, You've made something from nothing. You're powerful. And you've made man ruler over your creation to show your glory. But man rebelled and forsook his position. We all know the story. Adam ate from the tree that God told him not to eat and brought sin into the world. The penalty for sin was death because God would not let man live eternally in his sin, so man lost it. We will need a second Adam to reclaim God's original purpose for man to rule, but only after he redeems man from his sin, which brings us to the next covenant. Number two is the Adamic covenant. The chief word here is the word redemption. So because of Adam's sin, God curses man animals and the earth so it will yearn for his redemption so immediately after sin occurs god tells us how he will deal with it genesis 3:15 god reveals his unconditional covenant and his curse upon the serpent by saying i will put enmity between you and your seed meaning satan and the woman's seed meaning jesus he will crush your head and you will strike his heel Satan will inflict minor damage on Christ through crucifixion, but Christ will inflict major damage on Satan by defeating the curse of death. Jesus is the only one who can accomplish this because he will be born of the Holy Spirit, incarnated, going around the curse, born without man's sin. As time went on, man's newfound sin deteriorated into a sick and depraved wasteland of evil until every intent and thought on his heart was wicked. And God said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And that took place in Genesis 6, verse 7. Number three is called the Noahic Covenant. The key word here is the word restraint. This covenant shows an attribute of God that we can be grateful for, and that is his restraint. For instead of blotting out the entire human race, he preserved Noah and all the animals in the ark and restrained his wrath partly because of his mercy, but also partly because of his covenants, which he cannot change. Then in Genesis 8, 21, God makes a covenant that he will never again destroy all living creatures and gave Noah and the earth the rainbow as a sign of that covenant promise. But man would soon turn back to sin in an effort to make a name for himself at the Tower of Babel, where we see the introduction of other gods. So God scattered them among the nations to begin a new nation for himself. Our fourth covenant is called the Abrahamic covenant. The key word here is the word restore. In Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3, God chooses one man through whom he will restore his people to himself, Abraham. And in that covenant, God promises him three things. In verse 1, he promises him land. In verse 2, he promises him a people. And in verse 3, he promises him blessing. The land was Israel, the people were the Jews, and the blessing is they will be the touchstone of God towards all the people of every nation to know of him through them, to bless those who bless you and to curse those who curse you. And God made good on his promise too, because as the nation grew greatly, Egypt enslaved them and God saw their affliction and cursed Egypt greatly through Moses and brought them safely out in the Exodus. Our fifth covenant is called the Mosaic Covenant. Key word here is the word reveal. Now that Israel had grown into a great multitude of people, God brought them to Mount Sinai to make a covenant. This covenant was to serve as a temporary supervisor, teaching the righteous standards of God and reveal man's sin until the coming of Christ. 
In Leviticus 26, God tells Israel in verse 1, have no other gods. Verse 2, keep the Sabbath. Verse 3, keep his laws and commandments. So while the first four covenants were only up to God, the Mosaic covenant has conditions for man. And through those conditions, man will have his sin revealed and he will see the need for a sacrifice. The Mosaic Covenant was temporary until Christ fulfilled every requirement of it, living perfectly and dying as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of all who believed. The Sixth Covenant is called the Palestinian Covenant. Its key word is return. Well, the old guys died and the young guys forgot the Mosaic Covenant and didn't keep God's laws. So in Deuteronomy 29, God tells them, that they will not keep his covenant. And in Deuteronomy 30, verse 2 and 3, he tells them, come back to me. Because when they do, and verse 4 and 5 reminds them of what God promised in the Abrahamic covenant, land, seed, and blessing. In verse 6, something more, a new heart, which hasn't happened yet until Christ returns and gathers them to a new land. The seventh covenant is called the Davidic covenant. And the key word here is the word reign. After 500 years of judges chaotically administering God's law, God appointed a king named David. King David loved the Lord with all of his heart, and in 2 Samuel 7, 12-16, God makes a covenant with David that he will give David's son Solomon three things. Number one, a throne. Number two, a house. And number three, a kingdom forever. After David died, Solomon received the benefit of this covenant with the most prosperous kingdom in Israel's history. But the covenant promise was forever, and Solomon eventually died. So this covenant had a second meaning, to reveal David's greater son of another nature, Jesus Christ, who would be from David's royal line 490 years later. The eighth covenant was called the New Covenant. Key word here is the word regenerate. After David and after many evil kings in Israel and Judah, God sends Israel into exile under Babylon. But before he does, he promises them in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 27 through verse 34, that he will bring them back one day and give them, and God invents a term here, he will give them a new covenant. In verse 32, God says they have been like babies needing their hand held. But in verse 33, one day they will be sons with new hearts. Like a Jewish boy going through bar mitzvah becoming a man. This is Israel's bar mitzvah. The law was for babies, teaching them about their sin. Grace is for sons of God, with the law written on their hearts. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It hasn't happened to Israel yet, but Jesus spoke of this new covenant at the Last Supper for the church as we were grafted in. So, we got their king and their covenant. And in verse 34, God will forgive everything they've done. The Christian's purpose doesn't cast aside Israel but makes Israel jealous until the second coming of Jesus, when all the covenants will be fulfilled and God's purpose from the very beginning for his children to rule and enjoy him forever will be accomplished once and for all. And those, ladies and gentlemen, are the covenants of God. Uh, 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 under the microscope of God, Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's uh, I know we don't want to hear that, but <laughs> but but it's important that you put all aspects of your life uh, before God, that you put God first in all areas of your life. And that includes your sex life. OK, y'all still not with me. OK. <laughs> and so and so just when choosing a life mate, that it is important that you can that that you counsel with God, that you you allow God to to move in your life as it relates to who you select as your life partner or your life mate the, the, your love interest okay and okay I sh i'm talking to myself <laughs> okay and so uh and so we see that 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 that's here because again i, I can only look back over my own life because i didn't always do that 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 my sex life was my business my love life was my business and 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 i, w I would pray to god about a bunch of other stuff but i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily counsel with God on this and so but it's important that God is not just interested he's interested in the entire human being Amen. that that all aspects all areas of your life and, and choosing a life mate or, or you know loving someone 
to 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 you know potentially be your life mate is a very important decision decision and i think what got the people of, of israel in trouble so often is that they fell in love with with or maybe not even love they fell in lust with with folks that were outside of their their belief and because of that those people that they were you know intermingling with were uh, was able to turn them from what they believe to to what they believe brother anthony go ahead Uh, we have marriage counseling because Amen. when you're with a uh, a Bible-based pastor mm-hmm. or uh, 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 someone who could uh, uh, help you through uh, uh, this marriage, uh, a Bible-based counselor, uh, they're going to bring up everything uh, about uh, okay, do you about life things that that will come up uh, based from a spiritual point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you're not going to necessarily be asking that person while you're dating them Amen. in one sense, Amen. Uh, you know. And so, yeah. and, and, and so it's, it's important that, you know, in today's world that you have a uh, 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 marriage counseling mm-hmm. so that everybody will know what to expect. Amen. He will know what to expect from her. Mm-hmm. And she will. And the most important thing, are you in Christ? Yeah. And if you're not, why? So that person can have the opportunity to choose if they want to go forward Mm -hmm. with the relationship, not to force someone to uh, accept Christ as Lord and Savior, but to let them know how important it is. Right. Absolutely. And I think all too often back in in, in biblical times and even to this day where you have uh, marriages where one is a believer and one is not, that there's that you're really. I mean, I've seen it work, but then I've also seen it more often than not not work. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I think you're really just setting yourself up for failure that I think one party believes that, okay, I can turn this person to my way of thinking. And, 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 and a lot of times the, the Christian ends up getting turned, <laughs> you know, to, you know, and so uh, and God just really, you know, in his wisdom and his foreknowledge, he's just, you know, I think. He's just saying, look, you can save yourself a lot of time and headache and trouble if you would just just get with somebody that's like minded in the faith. okay, and and just then you don't even have to have those discussions. You don't even have to have those arguments that why are you spending all that time down there? Why are you giving them all that money? Or or why, you know, you know, why you don't ever pay attention to me? You are always reading this, your Bible. And, you know, yeah, not that it's going to be easy, but I mean, those are just, you know, when you when you're with somebody that's that's of the same faith, you you head off a lot of com- of, of discussions and arguments that that would have happened, you know, regarding your faith. Okay, and so the next uh, area that they wanted to put under the Microsoft that that they wanted to uh, specifically put before God in their covenant was their their business or their career life. Okay, so you have your sex life. Now you have your career life. And so verse 31 then says, and if the people of the land bring ware or merchandise or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. And so basically what they're saying is that uh, uh, they are going to observe the Sabbath, okay, which is what got them in trouble uh, in the first place, which was which was what got them sent to Babylon in slash Persia in the first place because they neglected the Sabbath for so long. Yeah. Okay, and so those seventy years they were they were in captivity represented the seventy years that they didn't let the land rest, you know, on those uh seventy Sabbath years that they that they continued to harvest the land. Okay, and if they would have just let the land alone on that seventh year, I mean, God is trying to give you a vacation. He's trying to give you time off. He's trying to let you kick your feet up, and he's trying to let you, okay, forget about that for a minute and focus on on me and, and what I've done and just, con- you know, count your blessings, this and the other, because on that Sabbath year, even if you don't work the land, the land is still going to produce. The land, you know, just because it's a Sabbath year doesn't mean that the apple tree is just going to not grow that year. <laughs> okay, that that the trees, your orchards are still going to produce fruit that year. You know, you'll probably have weeds growing up everywhere, but I mean, the the, the trees are still going to produce. The the grapevines are still going to produce even in that Sabbath year. So you can still 
enjoy and, 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 you know, you can still have, you know, you can still harvest the land. Well, not harvest it the way you would, you know, during a, a regular year. But, I mean, you could still, you're not going to lack, right. is all we're saying. Because, again, that's a scarcity mindset that a lot of us have sometimes, that, that, that God is trying to get us out of a scarcity mindset, that we serve a God of abundance, not of scarcity, and that, that he is not going to see the righteous forsaking or his seed begging bread. Okay. Okay. He's going to take care of you. And so just because you don't work the land for a year doesn't mean you're going to starve. <laughs> okay. And so in your business and in your career life that you want to observe in your business practices, you want to observe the Sabbath. And so we talked about how even today uh, some people work on Sundays. And that's, you know, it is what it is that that if you have a job that that that's OK, Sunday is not a, a day off for you. So that means you can't you know, come in fellowship with, uh, with, you know, with, with us here in the church, and, and we get that. But it doesn't mean that you still can't observe the Sabbath, that whatever your off days are in a week, that if you're off, okay, I'm not off on Saturday and Sunday, I'm off on Thursday and Friday. Okay, if those are your off days, then one of those days should be your Sabbath, either that Thursday or that Friday, whichever you select, that, okay, you may not be here in the house of prayer, but that Sabbath day is a day that you recognize you know, God for what he's doing in your life and what he's done in your life and that you can still, you know, observe the Sabbath in that way. And, and if it's on a Thursday, you can join, the, you can be on the prayer, you can be on the Bible study. That can be part of your Sabbath. You can incorporate that and so that, you know, the, the Sabbath day the, is the Lord's day and it's a day where you, uh, 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 you know, where God is, is first and foremost on your mind that day, you know, and, and okay, good stuff. Right. What I wanted to say, you don't have to be in a group in order to honor the Lord. And it, you could be by yourself. Mm -hmm. And and if you had, and, and the Bible does say, according to Hebrews uh, 10, 25, uh, to forsake not to come in together the saints. Right. But I'm going to tell you something. Some of my greatest growth opportunities is when I spent alone time in prayer, in study, by myself, mm. shutting down the phone and turning off the TV and worshiping God through his word and asking God, well, what does this scripture mean? What should I know? How shall I follow it? And calling on him as individually. Then once I go to uh, a Bible study class mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or whatever, and I'm able to be with uh, uh, church members or I can ask questions according to that, and I found myself over time, God usually uh, shows me stuff when I'm away from the church, when I'm away from my study, and all of a sudden I hear something, and I, I say, oh, my God, is that what you meant by Amen. that? Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Did you? Okay. But definitely that, that your alone time can be productive time, but as you said, we, we don't want to neglect the assembly because, God, because, uh, again, there are benefits to being in the assembly as well because we can draw strength uh, from each other because yeah. I may come in here feeling down and I can look at uh, Sister Battle or I can look at Brother Sam and he can you know either play something on his instrument over there or Sister Battle can 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 say something encouraging to me and, and bring me you know out of my doldrums and 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 to uh, be encouraged be an encouragement to me uh, a lot of, uh, well many times <laughs> and so again we can draw strength from each other by the assembly and, and again, talking about that, that, that next level accountability that, that Sister Battle and Brother Sam and, and Brother Rick and, and Brother Darren, they all, they hold me accountable because then if they see me, you know, doing something that's untoward or they see me out in the parking lot and I'm maybe, you know, four letter words coming out of my mouth or I'm, I'm acting, you know, out a certain way, they can say, Brother Bullard, that ain't, well, you know, what's up with that? Now, you know, that ain't, that ain't, you know, that ain't me. That ain't what, you, you know, what's, you know. You know, and then they can, you know, pull my coattail and, you know, either counsel me, you know, or, or just talk to me about, okay, well, what's, what's really going on? Yeah. You know, and we can have a, and, and we can minister one to each other. You know, he can minister to me at that moment that I'm, you know, maybe acting out. Uh, uh, and so, again, with that's the benefit of being 
amongst the saints, the being for the saints coming together. But again, if Sunday, you know, doesn't, you know, again, if you work Sundays, then you have to draw that from, from someone else. And that's where important that I, I really praise God for our membership ministry and the job Sister Tuff does that she, her and her crew, they, 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 they do a great job of keeping in touch with the body that even while we were not meeting here during the pandemic, they were, we, were still, we still had a connectiveness uh, because they made those calls and they checked on our membership and they, you know, they had those conversations that, you know, how you doing? How's everything? Anything we can, you know, that so, so no one really felt disconnected, you know, and now that we're back to, to a point uh, in, the, in the building that it's great and that, that we didn't have a huge drop off in membership because nobody was following up with anybody. Okay, and so great job uh, there. And so moving on, so we see we got a little time. So the third area of their life that they wanted to, again, emphasize in this covenant was their financial life. Okay, and so I'm going to just read straight through the rest of the chapter, uh, starting at verse 32. It says, also we made ordinance for us to charge ourselves, again, underline charge ourselves, for us to charge ourselves, for us to charge ourselves, I'm emphasizing that, for us to charge ourselves yearly, for us to charge ourselves yearly, so this was an annual uh, a fee that was paid with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. And so again, that, that phrase, house of our God, is going to occur over and over for the rest of the chapter. Nine times you're going to see that phrase, the house of our God. And so it was an emphasis on the people to understand that this is not the priest's house, this is not the Levite's house. This is not the Nethanim's house. This is not the singers, the porters, the any of these other titles here of folks in the house. This is not their house. This is the house of our God. Amen. East Bay Bible Church, this is, this is the house of our God. This is not our house. Despite how comfortable we seem to get in here. <laughs> I'm just saying because we come in here. And we go in there, we raid the icebox, you know, we, you know, we kick our, like it's our house. You know, we come in here, and I do it too. So it's like we come in here and say, oh, what we got in the refrigerator? You know, if we see snacks, we'll, you know, come in here, we may turn the TV on and, and, <laughs> and, and you know, whatever. But, I mean, we treat this place like it's our, you know, like, okay, this is, our, this is just one of my, my second homes here. And we just, I mean, and it's cool. You want to be comfortable in the house of God, but you want to you wanna understand, first and foremost, that this is the house of God. Okay, so this, and treat it as such, amen. And so this is the house of our God for the showbread, for the continual meat offering, and for the continual burnt offerings of the Sabbath and of the new moons, for the set feasts, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings, to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God, that we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for the wood offering to bring into the house of our God, after the house of our fathers at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law and to bring the first fruits of our of our ground and the first fruits of all trees year by year unto the house of our Lord uh, also the firstborn of our sons and our cattle of our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstlings of our herds and our flocks to bring the to the house of our God unto the priests that minister in the house of our God that and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees of wine and of oil unto the priests unto uh, the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of the our ground uh, unto the Levites and the same Levites might have the tithes in all cities of our tillage and the priest, uh, okay, so you can read the rest of that. I'm kind of pressing for time here. And so what we're seeing here is that uh, the, the f their financial commitment, their stewardship, if you will, they want to put their stewardship under the, the microscope of, of, of this covenant with God. And so if you turn to Exodus uh, 30, 13, it, it goes on to say, and actually I think 11 through 13, it goes on to say that, that this was the Lord's words in, in Exodus, that the Lord said, that a, and again, I don't have time to turn to it, but in essence, the Lord said in Exodus 30, 13, that, that they were to give half a shekel. Yeah, okay. okay, but here, mm -hmm. it says that we, we charge ourselves, for us to charge ourselves, they, so this was their idea, mm -hmm. that okay, we're, we, we're, we're not going to do half, we're, gonna, we're only going to do a third. Mm -hmm. 
And so it says a couple of things to me, not, you know, so much negative. Oh, my God, they, they, they changed God's, you know, plan of attack here, that they changed it from a half to, to a third. Man, they're cheating God, this, that, and the other. And so, uh, one, God doesn't need our money. <laughs> okay, that God can get his program accomplished. He doesn't need, he doesn't need our money. Now, he takes the money, <laughs> but he doesn't need the money, okay? And so the fact that they, they changed it from a half to a third, you know, could be, and I'm, this is my speculation here, that one, because uh, we saw earlier in the chapter that the, 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 the king of Persia was kind of financing what was going on here in Jerusalem. And so we don't know if that's still the case, if, if they're still getting funds from Persia in this. And so if that being the case that, you know, maybe they didn't need to pay a half, a shekel that they can pay a third, and, or uh, financial conditions could have been such that maybe they didn't have, <laughs> you know, half a shekel, that, that they, they, they lowered the tax rate, if you will, so that the folks could, all, per all the folks could participate. Because this, this was really a, a temple tax what this was, this wasn't their tithe, but this was like a one-time, this was an annual self-imposed temple tax, and these funds went to the upkeep and to the ministry of the house of God, okay? And much like today, that when you pay in your tithes, because a lot of people don't, you know, pay tithes, or maybe they'll, they'll won't pay, you know, full 10% or whatever they give, that, you know, they, they're hesitant because they, they believe that, okay, well, they're just paying them preachers. That's all they're doing, you know, we ain't, you know, they ain't doing nothing but, you know, giving that minister money or this, that, and the other. But we have to, we understand that, that, you know, it, it costs money to keep the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it costs money to, for you to come in here and raid the icebox and get whatever's in there. Yeah. That, uh, that it costs money, that it costs money, that we have coffee every, every, uh, every Sunday for those that drink coffee. It's all back there for you to help yourself. All that costs money. And yes, we do pay salaries. With that as well, we do pay our, our pastors and, and some others that are on staff here, and we do pay that. But again, uh, that's not where all our money goes. That again, that it costs money to, to do ministry. Amen. Okay? And, and again, we do, as our, our motto says, we do church on purpose. And, and to do that takes it takes it takes money. And so, uh, and so we see some of the things that goes on then to, to list. Uh, a lot of the things that these funds are going for. So in addition to the temple tax, they also pay their tithes in that, okay? And so, uh, again, temple tax, like I said, when I read that, I said, okay, that's not a bad idea. Um, I know a lot of us pay enough now, you know, in, in, in our tithes and in our offerings, but I, uh, I guess to levy a temple tax in addition to that, you know, it's, you know, that means you may want to consider that, but, you know, anyway, anyway, anyway. And so, uh, so we see that in one is for the showbread, uh, for your meat offerings, uh, for burnt offerings, for wood offerings, which is really, this is the first uh, mention of wood offering uh, in scripture here. And so what that meat, what that represented was that there was a fire that was always burning 24-7, seven, seven days a week. And obviously, if you're going to have a fire, you got to have wood. Okay. And so the, the wood offering would be... Um, we saw, I think one of the verses talking about 34 says they cast lots among the priests and the Levites and the people for the wood offering. So that basically just means that when they talk about casting lots, you know, some would say shooting dice or whatever. But it was a way that that they made some decisions and they would take turns amongst uh, the priests, Levites and, and some of the other people would take turns in, in supplying the wood for the fire that burned 24-7 because they didn't want to leave it on one person to, to have to get up in the middle of the night and go put wood on the fire so it didn't go out. That, so they would cast lots and take turns with it. So one week, I would put wood on it the next week. Uh, Brother Derek would put wood on it the following week. Maybe Brother DeYoung put wood on it. And so they would rotate that around, and they would take turns in supplying the wood for the fire that burnt 24-7 because this fire you know, would be where they would uh, perform their burnt offerings, uh, perform their meat offerings, and, and all that. It, this would all go on that fire, and so it's important that this fire never go out, okay? And so the wood offering was very important. And so then we see that the first fruits, and we talk about in, in past lessons, we always talk about first fruits always speak of more to come. Okay, 10 o'clock, I'm done, a couple minutes. 
um, that first fruits always speak of more to come. That 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 when you when you have your first fruits, the first things come up. Those first things are de- always dedicated to God. Okay, and in doing so, you are showing a measure of faith that yes, God, I'm giving you my first fruits, and I understand that you are the one in control of the ground and of the crops and of, of all first things, and that that just as I'm giving you this, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not gonna take it unto myself. I'm going to give it to you and because I understand that you have the power and the authority to, to provide more. Amen. Okay, and just like Christ is our first fruits and that meaning that, that just like he was the first one to die and to rise and to ascend back to his father, he was the first one to do that. And so he is our first fruits and that he did that in just the same way he did it, we're going to do it. Okay, so we are the more to come yeah. in that sense. Okay, and so I'm going to finish there, and you guys can read the rest and understand that first fruits of the ground, the firstborn, the firstlings, the fruit trees, the suns, the cattle, the flour, the oil, the trees, the corn, all that is, is, is supposed to be dedicated first. And so I really, what I wanted to say before I'm done is that God wants your name on the new covenant. Okay, and, and, and just like you have 84 names here, and like I said, those 84 names may not mean nothing to nobody here. But they mean something to God. Amen. And because and that's why they are they're, they're written in the book. OK. And like I said, we don't know them. They don't mean nothing to us. But the same way God want is, is knows, recognizes these 84 names on the list. He wants your name Amen. on the on our new covenant. We're, again, we're in the new covenant now. And, but just like the 84 names are here on the old covenant that that he wants your name to be on that new covenant. Amen. And so we'll end it there. So Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you now for this time of study. We praise you for your word, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that something was said or done that brought edific- uh, that brought enlightenment and edifications uh, to you and to our understanding. Lord God, we pray that uh, just something, Lord God, that uh, people can take into their everyday life with thee. And Lord God, just please hold all the mistakes uh, are, are mine and not yours. Father God, we just thank you. We praise you and we love you for this time of study. Now we ask that you would use the man of God who will be uh, proclaiming an uncompromising gospel message. Uh, Lord God, that you would use him as your mighty instrument and we are going to thank you in advance, Lord God, for what you are going to do uh, in the further parts of this service. It's in your name we pray and ask it all. Amen.